I want to give you the context of our main passage before we stand in just a minute when we read it. So what's happening in 1 Chronicles 25 is David is in the process of preparing things for when Solomon's going to take over. He's getting things in order so that when Solomon becomes king, things are settled. He's trying to take care of things for his boy and get things lined up. And before chapter 25, there are some previous chapters that discuss how David prepares for the temple to be built. He organizes uh, Levites. He organizes priests. He's getting things in order. So it's with that in mind, I'm going to ask you to stand. We're just going to read the first seven verses. And I'm going to pray that God helps me read some of these names. Because there's a lot of them that we don't hear normally. Well, what's happening in our main passage is David's organizing the musicians for praising the Lord. 1 Chronicles 25 starts in verse 1. It says, David and the chiefs of the service also set apart for the service of the sons of Asaph, of Heman, and Jeduthun, who prophesied with lyres, harps, and cymbals. The list of those who did work, did the work and of their duties was of the sons of Asaph, Zachar, Joseph, Nethaniah, and Asherah, sons of Asaph, under the direction of Asaph, who prophesied under the direction of the king. Of Jeduthun, the sons of Jeduthun, Gedaliah, Zerai, Jesheah, Shimei, Hashabiah, and Mattathiah. I don't know anybody in the church with these names, do you? Six, under the direction of their father Jeduthun, who prophesied with the lyre in thanksgiving and praise to the Lord. Of Heman, the sons of Heman, Bekiah, Madaniah, Uziel, Shabuel, and Jeremoth, Hananiah, Hanani, Eliatha, Gedaltai, and Romamtai, Ezer. This one's a long one, help me, Jesus. Joshbekasha, Malathi, Hothir, and Mahaziah. Thank you, Jesus. I feel like I was just praying in tongues there. <laughs> Verse 5. All these were the sons of him and the king's seer, according to the promise of God to exalt him. For God had given Heman fourteen sons and three daughters. They were all under the direction of their father in the music in the house of the Lord with cymbals, harps, and lyres for the service of the house of God. Asaph, Jeduthun, and Heman were under the order of the king. And the number of them, along with their brothers, who were trained in singing to the Lord, all who were skillful, was 288. So let's bow our heads and pray. Lord, I'm just praying that you would help us to grab from your word what you want us to grab. That you would plant the seed of your word in our hearts. That our hearts would be good soil to receive and produce godly fruit. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. You can be seated. My first point this morning is that praise is vital for the life of the believer and the church. I'm going to say it again, and then I'm going to get an amen. We're going to participate today, right? Amen. It's a little early, but we'll... <laughs> praise is vital for the life of the believer and the life of the church. Amen. It's necessary. You take me to a church or a congregation, or a family of believers where there's no praise, and I'll show you a church that's dead. So you say, that sounds very emotional. No, listen, because think about it. If there's no praise in the church, there's no giving of thanks to God at all. Now, I realize you can praise in different ways, that it's not just about music, but I think music's pretty important. And I think the way you handle music and the way you approach music is very important. This is going to offend some people, but I'm just going to throw it out there. I believe that every form of music is a form of praise in some way. You like that? You don't like that? It is what it is. The truth is truth and a lie is a lie. I believe every form of music worships someone. It's either God, the enemy, or self. Now, I want you to look at what's happened in our main passage. I'm going to highlight a couple of things fairly quickly. In verse 2, it says, the sons of Asaph prophesied. How many of you know that prophecy in and of itself, is a, it's a proclamation of the things of God? That's yes or no. Prophecy in and of itself is a proclamation of the things of God. So when we read this passage, and it says, the sons of Asaph prophesied, 
We're talking about the musicians. We're talking about instruments prophesying. We're talking about voices prophesying. Declaring the things of God. Listen, I love when we have moments where we have people tearing a guitar up or a drum solo or whatever else. I love that stuff. I love music. I always have. But we have to go beyond the performance aspect of how something sounds and understand that it's really about releasing the sound of heaven that God has put within us. It goes much deeper than just, man, that, good grief, I didn't know you could hit the drums like that. Or I didn't know anybody could play guitar. That was amazing. You know, we've turned, in a lot of ways, the church into a concert hall where we come in, and it's not just here. We've turned the church into a concert hall where people will come in and we will admire the gifts that are on display instead of understanding that the gifts that are on display are for the sole purpose of glorifying the one who gave them. Yes, it's a beautiful thing. There's a reason that I look over at Don and, he, and I give him a little, and then he goes, Wah! There's a reason I'll look at Tim or whoever's on the drums and be like, Hey, go, and they're all over the place. Like, it's more than just music. It's releasing a sound that God's put in you to declare His goodness to everything around you. You can do that in your car. You can do that at home. But the sons of Asaph prophesied. These are singers in the church, musicians in the church. That word prophesied, it means to speak under the influence of a divine spirit. Verse 3, the sons of Jeduthun, it says, They prophesied with the lyre, and they prophesied in a way that gave thanksgiving and praise to the Lord. That word praise, the definition means to shine or to make a fool of. So now we are talking about David, where he says, I will become even more undignified than this. And the story where he's talking to his wife, Michael, and she says, David, you look like a fool out there dancing around. You're, you're acting crazy. You made yourself... That, that was un, very unbecoming of a king. He says, in Aaron's translation, he says, woman... <laughs> See, Morgan laughs. I never do that at home, correct? See, so that's... It's true. Listen, I've said we have moments of intense fellowship, but I've never looked at her and said, Woman, <laughs> hang with me here. It's okay. Get your, get your laugh out. All right. He looks at her and he says, Listen, if you think that was bad, you think the way I was... You think that looked crazy? You can wait and see what I'm about to do. I'll become even more undignified than this. I will throw my praise. I will pour myself out before the Lord. Verse 5, the sons of Heman, it says they were exalting God. To exalt means to lift up. So think about what's happening. As, as these sons of these various people, Asaph, Jeduthun, and Heman are operating before the Lord, they're prophesying, they're giving thanks, they're praising God, and they are lifting up His name. And they were doing it, verse 6 says at the very end, they were doing it for service of the house of God. Now, I think this is important. I believe that there is much to be said about following God's order and following godly patterns. I am a firm believer that if you get the pattern right, the glory of God will fall. I'm going to say that again because I'm hoping more people will come along with that. I am a firm believer that if you get the pattern right, in other words, if you walk in obedience to what God says that His glory will be made manifest among us. Do you believe that, yes or no? Yeah. And see, David understood that. Praise was not an afterthought to David. I mentioned earlier in the message, you see all these different things happening and taking place. David's organizing. He organizes the priests. He organizes the Levites. He organizes all these different things. And now we're in chapter 25. He's taking specific time to organize musicians. Even to a point where he tells each one of them in a way what to do. If you read through the rest of that chapter, you see how they're all allotted. Like these sons are supposed to do this job. These ones are supposed to do that job. On and on we go. 
He's very specific. He knew, David, knew the importance of praise. And he wanted to make sure that it was well established in the temple of the Lord. Our main passage said there were 288 people who were involved in regular worship before the Lord. Now we're not talking about just a Sunday morning. We're talking about around the clock, 24-7, there were always people ministering in music and in song in the presence of God. Constant praise and worship. Constantly lifting up and prophesying. Friends, praise and the heart with which we praise matters. When we gather together and when you're alone, the heart with which you praise matters. If you come into church, and I don't care your, your posture of, look, some people are going to stand like this. You have some people who do this thing. Some will go a little higher. Some will dance. Some will and some not. I would fall under the not category, just putting that out there. But. but if you come into church and your thought process is, I'm going to come in and, oh, this is, this is nice. Or, oh, I'm just going to sing along until my favorite song comes. Man, are they going to do, do that one song again? I love when they do that one song. And I realize we all have songs that hit us differently. Right? Especially through various seasons of life. You'll have a song that for whatever reason it'll speak to you because you're walking through something and you'll think, oh man, like that's it for me. This isn't a talent show. And it's not a radio station to make your request. You know, I heard a quote one time. I, I don't follow everything that Francis Chan does, but I heard a quote one time. Some of you probably already know what I'm about to say. Somebody came to him after a service when he was still pastoring and was like, hey, you know, the worship was just kind of, it was okay today. Francis Chan looked at him and said, that's all right, we weren't worshiping you. You see, and there's the problem within many churches today. We've turned praise and worship into a what can I feel kind of thing instead of pouring out our heart and praise to God, which is what it's intended to be in the first place. If you come in and your song doesn't hit and you leave like, man, they haven't played that in like forever. See, I'll even say it this way. Praise and worship is not about how much energy you have. Praise and worship is not about how good you feel. Praise and worship is not about you at all. And I'm telling you, when the church grabs a hold of that understanding, that it literally has nothing to do with us and everything to do with pouring out our heart and praise and worship to Him, so that's when the whole atmosphere of the place changes. Because it's not about anything that, that God can do for me. It's God, I already know what you have accomplished for me. And because of the finished work of Christ on the cross, even if you don't do anything for me for the rest of my life, which we all know God will do stuff for us, right? right. But even if He didn't, I have reason enough just through the finished work of the cross and the resurrection I have every bit enough reason to praise God for all of eternity. I'm going to tell you something else. We've talked a lot about revival. We've talked a lot about the manifest presence of God, experiencing a move of God, all that different terminology. I can tell you when you're in the glory of God, you can't help but praise. Where do you get that, Pastor? Think about what's going on in the throne room of heaven right now where the angels are gathered around and the only thing they can get out of their mouth is to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, the one who was and is and is to come. Friends, I will even be as bold and as blunt to say it this way. If you don't like praise, you don't really like God as much as you think you do.
That might come across as offensive, but if you don't, that's what's happening in heaven. I want you to think about what that means. Now, I'm not saying you've got to act a certain kind of way. I don't care about the posture of your body. We're talking about the posture of your heart. You raise your hands, great. You don't, whatever. As long as you're praising God, that's all that matters. But think about it. To say that you don't really care about praise and worship, what's praise? What's worship? You're pouring yourself out before the Lord. So what are you saying now? That you're too good to give God praise? You, look, I'm not trying to beat anybody down. I'm trying to pick the church up because we're seeing things come up in the church through praise and worship. We're seeing the not only the worship team, I'm talking about Sundays. We had a prayer meeting on Thursday nights, and most people we probably ever had show up to a prayer meeting on a Thursday. We're seeing God do great things in the church, but I'm trying to encourage you to say, let's go even higher still. Let's not stay in this place of, of, of this is all right. It's like Ezekiel, the river of God. I don't want to just splash around in the ankle deep water. I want to go swimming where my feet can't touch. A person and a church that truly lives in revival will always maintain a heart of passionate praise unto God. I am a firm believer of that. I'll say it one more time. You don't even have to say amen if you don't want to. A person and a church that truly lives in revival will always maintain a heart of passionate praise unto God. Every time. You look at any manifest move of God where there's been something extended, what we call revival. I'm telling you, there's a, a heart of prayer and there's a heart of praise that is prevalent in those churches. So the question is, can the same thing be said about us that was said about David? Do we have a serious heart toward praise? See, David knew his time was almost up. He knew that he was going to be passing things on to his son Solomon. And David said, I'm going to make sure that everything is set and in order. I'm going to make sure that there's consistent and continual praise in the presence of the Lord in the temple. He takes 288 of them. And it says they were all skillful. I bet that was an awesome worship team. 288 of them. I bet they tore it up. I want to look at a few passages from the book of Psalms. Psalm 95, verses 1 and 2. O oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into His presence with thanksgiving. Is that the heart you came to church with today? Or did you come asking God to do stuff for you, and if He didn't meet your requirements, then you're just going to kind of go home? Let us come into His presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to Him with songs of praise. Psalm 103, verses 1 through 5. Bless the Lord. The word bless means to praise and adore. So praise the Lord, adore the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless His holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all His benefits, who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. Friends, I want you to take note that there are several reasons for which we can give God praise. This is a couple of yes or no questions. If you can't say yes to this, then don't. But if you can, I want you to. Here's a question. Have you been forgiven? Yes. Have you received healing ever in your life? Yes. Have you redeemed, been redeemed by the work of the Lord Jesus Christ? Yes. Has He crowned you with love and mercy? Yes. And has He satisfied you with good? Yes. Oh, how easy it is to forget the things that God has done for us. Blinders. in the wrong kind of way. You see, we need the blinders that say, I'm going to fix my eyes on Jesus, the author and the finisher of my faith. Right? But what happens is, instead of that, we don't look at Jesus, we pay attention to everything else around. 
short-sightedness. We forget about the goodness of God. We forget about the inheritance that we have as children of God. Not only in this life, but in the one to come. And we get wrapped up in controversies and debates and silliness. Small things. There's stuff that comes out of our mouths that should never come out of our mouths. I want to prove a point here. Okay, I, I need a volunteer. I'm going, to, I'm going to choose an adult. This is a fresh bottle of water, not opened. The only requirement for this is you're going to have to come up here. I'll stand with you. Uh, you know what? Just because, Tim, come on. <laughs> okay, so I want you to stand right here. Now I'm a, I'm a, That's all right. So go ahead and open it up. You're good. I, listen, you're not going to get water dumped on you or anything. This is a very simple... That's where I look at the bottom. No, no. It's, <laughs> no, that's not it. Okay. Just take a drink normal. You can just drink it, take it down, whatever else. You did a pretty good job on the drums today. Yeah, it was good. <laughs> Go ahead and take another drink. No, you're going to be taking a few drinks here oh. and there, all right? Can you say that God's been good to you? Yeah. You've experienced some things in your life that have been difficult, challenging, and has God seen you through? Then take another drink. This time I want you to fill your mouth up and don't swallow it. <laughs> Keep it there. <laughs> you got to stop laughing or he's going to spit it out. With the water in your mouth, I want you to complain to me about something. <laughs> you go ahead and drink it. His mouth was full of water. Nothing else could come out. If your mouth is filled with praise, there's no room for anything else. Mm-hmm. Now I want to read to you a passage of Scripture in Psalm 71. Look at what Psalm 71 says. Verse 8. My mouth is filled with your praise and with your glory all the day. How many of us could really say that about ourselves? How often do we complain? Now listen, I know we can take our needs before the Lord. There are a bunch of passages in Psalms where we see that happening. I'm not saying that you can never just say, hey, this is what it is. But it's the manner in which we say it. You can still pray about your problems... You can still talk about the things you're walking through with a mouth of praise. Let me give you an example of what that looks like, okay? So instead of saying, hey, my life's terrible right now, my car's falling apart, whatever else you fill the blank in with, instead of having that kind of a junky attitude, you go this way. You have the understanding, you know, I'm walking through some stuff right now. My car's giving me fits. You know, finances might be a little tight. But I know God's faithful. And you see that example all throughout the book of Psalms. David will say, God, I feel like everything's against me. Why is Saul chasing me and want to kill me? And he says, but Lord, I know your steadfast love. I know you care for me. It's this heart and this mentality to say, God, my mouth is going to be filled with your praise. And that's an encouragement I have for each of you. My second point is going to be way shorter than my first one. And I'll get to it in just a second. But before I transition here, I want to say this. Praise should not simply be relegated to something you do on a Sunday morning. Praise is a lifestyle. Every day. Listen, when you wake up in the morning, you have two choices. You can float through the day or you can wake up and say, This is the day that the Lord has made and I will rejoice and be glad in it. Now something else that I find interesting... And this seems to be a common thread over the course of the last month or so in the church. Another reason it's important to maintain continual praise is in our main passage, our praise teaches the next generation. Our praise teaches the next generation. I don't know if you know that. The way you praise, the way we praise on a Sunday morning teaches the kids. There's a reason we keep them in here. And it's not because simply we're trying to give the nursery workers a break. It's because we want everybody in here. Family praise. Where we all together. Listen, I'm going to tell you, some of the times I get the most blessed is when I watch my two kids up front. 
They're in praise and worship. You know, your kids, you don't have to make it this thing. Listen, I realize sometimes kids are wild. Sometimes it might get a little messy. Sometimes you might hear a, ah, in the middle of worship, and it's not somebody praising, it's not somebody getting delivered from a demon either. It's just a kid being a kid, right? But I, I, I believe it's important for our kids to experience the presence of God. I believe it's vital for our children to experience the presence of God. And I know sometimes it's here, play with this toy, because if you don't, you're going to wreck the whole service. That's the way you feel about your kid, which is probably not true, but you're just trying to be respectful of everybody else here. But have you ever taken a moment on a Sunday morning to just, if you're here with your kids or grandkids or whatever, have you ever taken a moment to just say, hey, you know, they can stand in the chair next to you so they can see what's going on. Or you can say, hey, look, you know, maybe a small moment of explanation. Mom, why are they raising their hands? Well, here's why. You know, my prayer, not only for when their kids are in here, but even as they're in the back right now, even if they're in the nursery, man, the kids don't have to be babysat. Let's teach them to love Jesus, you know? And, you know, I can say that from personal experience. All the stuff I'm talking about, I've shared several stories throughout our time here about things I saw God do as a kid that changed my life. Things I... Having the privilege to pray with people and see them get saved as a child. Seeing people healed of sicknesses and terminal cancer and, and, and just crazy stuff. As a child. You see, those are the things that I can hold on to. Even as an adult, when I have moments where my faith might be wavering in one way or another, I can go back to and glean on those moments from my childhood. And I can say, God, I remember. I may not understand what's happening right now, but I remember... I remember when you did this. You know, we don't have to wait for kids to hit a certain age to start pushing them in the things of God. Do it now. Listen, we live in a world that's trying to get a hold of them at a younger and younger age every day. Some of the things that were not even close to being acceptable to be programmed when I was a kid for adults to watch, now they're on children's programs promoted as if it's no big deal. Listen, our children are being indoctrinated one way or the other. Are you going to take an active role in your child's life, or are you just going to let the world teach them for you? There was a key phrase in our main chapter in, in 1 Chronicles 25 that's mentioned several times. You know, we talked about Asaph, Jeduthun, and Heman, all right? We talked about these people, right? But I want you to grab hold of and understand what really happened here. In these verses, in verse 2, in verse 3, and in verse 5. In verse 2 it said, the sons of Asaph prophesied. In verse 3 it said, the sons of Jeduthun prophesied with the lyre. In verse 5 it said, the sons of Heman were exalting God. The fathers gave direction... But it was their children that were in service of the house of God. The rest of the chapter, if you were to sit and read 1 Chronicles 25, the rest of the chapter, there are several things mentioned, specifics. This family did this. This family did that. On and on it goes. But every single family that's mentioned, it says this phrase. It says, This person and his brothers and his sons. They did it. I'm talking about a family of praise. A family in the church, but a family in your specific families. A family of praise. We will, as for me and my house, we'll serve the Lord. Family of praise. Let's look at an earlier example. Okay, so we're talking about the sons of Asaph, Jeduthun, and Heman. You see, they had already set an example for their kids. They had already shown what a life of praise looked like. If you're to go back, remember our main passage is in 1 Chronicles 25. But if we rewind it to 1 Chronicles chapter 16, 
Let's look at what David did. So just to give you context of what's happening in 1 Chronicles 16, this is when David had successfully brought the Ark of the Covenant back to Jerusalem. So David brings the Ark of the Covenant back to Jerusalem. And I want you to look at how he has established regular praise and worship in the presence of God. Starting in verse 37 in 1 Chronicles 16, it says, So David left Asaph and his brothers there before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. So there's Asaph. How many of you are with me? This is going to come together in a minute. I just want to make sure we know who's here. Asaph is there. And he's left there to minister regularly before the ark as each day required. Every day, praise and worship in the presence of God. Verse 38, And also Obed-Edom and his 68 brothers. That's a lot of brothers. While Obed-Edom, the son of Jeduthun and Hosa, were to be gatekeepers. And he left Zadok the priest and his brothers the pri uh, and his brothers the priests before the tabernacle of the Lord in the high place that was at Gibeon, and to offer burnt offerings to the Lord on the altar of burnt offering regularly, morning and evening, regular worship before the Lord. To do all that is written in the law of the Lord that he commanded Israel. So how many of you know we said Asaph's there? We on the same page? Verse 41. With them were Heman and Jeduthun, and the rest of those chosen and expressly named to give thanks to the Lord, for His steadfast love endures forever. That, that was their job. Their job was to give thanks to the Lord. Think about that. It says that they were expressly given the task to give thanks to the Lord. Verse 42. Heman and Jeduthun had trumpets and cymbals for the music and instruments for sacred song. And the sons of Jeduthun were appointed to the gate. The only reason I bring that passage into this message today is because I want us to understand what's going on here and the pattern that we see. Asaph, Jeduthun, and Heman regularly worshipped in the presence of the Lord in 1 Chronicles 16. How many of you can agree with that? Yes. They were given a task. You will worship regularly before the Lord. Fast forward a few chapters later now to 1 Chronicles 25. Now it's not just Asaph, Jeduthun, and Heman, but it says that they had trained up their sons in such a way that each of their children were described as skillful. Would you mind to put up 1 Chronicles 25 and verse 7 on the screen? Because I want to make sure that everybody grabs this. So in 1 Chronicles 16, these three guys are regularly working in praise and thanksgiving in the presence of God. Now we're in 1 Chronicles 25, chapter 7, and it says, The number of them, along with their brothers, who were trained in the singing of the Lord, all who were skillful. And it says how many of them there were. Every single one of their sons... Their children were skillful. It wasn't just they kind of knew how to praise. It wasn't just, oh, well, they know how to sing a song or two. They had taken specific time. See, they set the example because they did it themselves in 1 Chronicles 16. But then they said, it's not just going to be about me and what I can do. I am going to make sure that my children know what it means to not only just kind of praise God, to kind of give thanks. No, I'm going to make sure that my children are skillful in praising the Lord. What if we took that kind of attitude when it comes to not only praising God, but our children's relationship with God? That I will do everything that I can to ensure that my kids love Jesus. I will. You better believe that, buddy. I will. That wasn't a threat. That was an encouragement, son. He looked at me like, oh, man, I'm in trouble. No, I will. Dad will do everything he can to make sure you love Jesus. I want to show you what it means to live a life of praise and worship unto God. A question I have for the church, are we creating a space? I want you to think about it. Don't answer it out loud. Are we creating a space where our children are learning what it means to praise God? Through the example that we set, are our children 
seeing what it means to truly offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. When we go home, do our kids see what it means to live a life of praise unto God? Are we training them up? Showing them the way? Are we taking time to invest in their lives? And even more specifically, are we taking time to grab them by the hand and say, this is how you give praise to the Creator. This is how you glorify and magnify the name of Jesus. The name above every name. A familiar passage that's read when people talk about raising your kids in a godly house is Proverbs 22.6. I'll go ahead and read it today. It says, train up a child in the way he should go, and even when he's old, he won't depart from it. Some of you, that's a promise you're sitting on now. You've got kids and grandkids that you say, man, I've been training them. I've been training them. I trained them, and now they're adults, and they're kind of away. Hold on to the promise. Hold on to it. They may be away now. The biblical promise is if you trained them in godliness, when they grow old, they won't depart from it. Let me be even more specific about what we're talking about today. If we teach our children... See, because how many of you know your kids are watching? Sometimes you wish they weren't. But they're watching. They're watching how you respond in the midst of adversity. They're watching how you respond when... When you're mad. They're watching how you respond when you're happy. When you're tired. When you're in mourning. When you're dealing with loss and grief. Children are watching. I can't tell you how many kids in this church come up to me on a Sunday morning. I'll get hugs and high fives and fist bumps. and Not, not all the kids like me. I mean, it just is what it is, but... It's not like the, the child whisper. I mean, there are kids that won't give me the time of day, and that's okay. Kids are watching. Even the simple things. You know, obviously, a lot of kids are fired up about the playground. We're waiting on a couple pieces of equipment to finish that. I cannot tell you how many times I've had a kid in this church come up to me and say, Pastor, when's the playground going to be done? <laughs> I'm like, go talk to Jade. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Delegation's a beautiful thing, isn't it? <laughs> Go talk to Jade. <laughs> if we believe praise is important, and we believe that praise is impactful, then why wouldn't we want to train our kids up to live a lifestyle of it? I want my kids to be in love with God. I want your kids to be in love with God. I want, when our kids go, we all go home from this place later today, I want for our children to be able to look at us and say, man, it was loud in there today. Man, it was like, we were singing and I was like sweating, mom, like, we were moving. Man, or, man, mom, why did it get so quiet at that one point of praise and worship? Like the music was, why did it get so quiet and then everybody just started praying? Why did that happen? I want our kids to ask questions about what's happening in the church. I want our kids to be able to say, Dad, we were in praise and worship today and I just I felt kind of funny. Like I felt like, I don't know, just I felt something different, but it was good. But I, I can't describe what I felt. I mean, don't you want that for your kids? I want that for mine. I want that for me. Praise the Lord. It's the order we're given. I believe for this church, praise the Lord. Pour out your praise in His presence. 
Take the, the best that you have and not the least you can muster up. What kind of praise do we offer to God? And what kind of praise that we offer to God really sets a good example for our children. By the time I reach the point of David's life, if the Lord tarries that long, Jesus doesn't come back by then for you, those of you who have no idea what I just said. If I get to the point where I'm old and gray, I want to be able to look at generations behind me, my kids and my grandkids, and if the Lord would give me the grace, my great-grandkids. And I want, to, I want to see worshipers, people in love with God. That's my goal. People who love God. That's your first legacy, friends. That's your first legacy as your children. Now, some of you are here today and you might say, my kids are old and they're grown. And what? You can still pray for them. You can set the example for them now. You know, maybe you feel like you missed opportunities years and years ago. If you're alive and they're alive, there's still opportunity for you to set the right example for your kids. Don't give me that baloney where you say, well, it's too late. No, it's not. If, if you're alive, and you are because you're here, and if they're alive, now some of you might be asleep, but you're still alive. I want to say this to you. I'm going to release what I believe to be an extremely short word from the church or for the church. And then we're going to bring the worship team up. We'll open the altars and we're going to pray. But I believe as we pursue the deep manifest presence of God, we cannot forget nor can we neglect our kids. We don't jump in the river of God and leave our kids on the banks. My life in the best way possible, was ruined by the presence of God as a child. I can sit in debates and people can show me certain things in Scripture on why they believe what they believe, but I'm telling you, the things I have seen and the things and ways in which I have encountered God from all the way to being a kid to now, there is no way anybody can convince me that God's not all-powerful. There's no way that anybody can convince me that God doesn't still heal, still heal today. There's no way that anyone can convince me that the baptism of the Holy Spirit was something that was relegated to the early church and is not available today. There's no way that anyone can convince me that the gifts of the Spirit are not active and supposed to be active in the church today because of what I've seen God do.